Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Today we're going to be in Revelation chapters 10 and 11. Sometimes I wish I had a crystal ball to know what John's talking about. As I have continued to struggle with these symbols with you through these lessons, it's becoming more and more obvious to me that John is pulling Old Testament metaphors, putting new New Testament content into them, and using them as symbols for the persecuted churches of that day and every day and ultimately the end time. Now, I realize when I say that that I've cut myself off from numerous interpreters who see a radical division between Israel and the church, particularly dispensational premillennialists. And though I feel like they have much to offer us in their commitment to the Bible, in my opinion, they have taken an apocalyptic prophecy and forced it into literalness which has drastically affected the proper interpretation. Now, on the other side, I see people in amillennialism who seem to spiritualize this passage uh, so beyond what I think is possible that I become nervous with overt spirituality and dogmatic, concrete literalness. Somewhere in between there is the truth. And we must go to the text to try to find it. We need to say as much as we can and not try to fit John's apocalyptic into rigid Western ways of thinking. Now, in chapter 10 is an interlude which shows us that the seals and the trumpets are at least parallel in structure. It seems to me that in, in uh, chapter 11, verse 15 through 19, it's obviously we've come to the second coming again as we did in the sixth seal. I do think that these are somewhat parallel, though it may be the seals lead up to the end time and the trumpets begin the events of the end time, which the bowls completely finish. But there is some kind of recapitulation relationship between the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Notice where it mentions. By the way, this, this is the interlude. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1 through 11, 14 is the interlude back, like back in chapter 7. Then I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now, John's in heaven. John's on the earth, a real fluidity. Another mighty angel. Now, many have asserted this is much like the angel back in chapter 5, verse 2, but it said another mighty angel. There are several mighty angels listed. Chapter 5, verse 2, here in 10, 1, and chapter 18, 21. Now, because of the description that follows, uh, which is going to be descriptions taken from a God and Christ, many have said this is Christ. But I don't think it can be Christ because he's called an angel, uh, because there are other mighty angels listed, uh, because he swears by God in verse 6, and because the angel in Daniel chapter 10 was also dressed uh, like God. So I think we're talking about an angel here, not Christ. Now, another mighty angel coming down from heaven, and he was clothed in a cloud. Now, from Psalms 97.2, Psalms 104.3, uh, Daniel 7.13, Acts 1.9, we know that the clouds the transportation of deity. So this is a very powerful. Some say this angel stands for Christ and Christ's word and Christ's victory. Well, I can certainly buy that because this is one humdinger of an angel, I want to tell you. And then with a rainbow over his head, and of course the rainbow speaks, I think, of the, the covenant promises and mercy and fidelity of God uh, going back, of course, to Noah. Uh, I think it was used in chapter 4, verse 3, for the throne of God. And there may be a direct allusion here to Ezekiel 1, 28. Uh, his face was like the sun. That goes back to Revelation 1, 16, a description of Christ. His legs were like pillar of fire. It goes back to Revelation 1, 15, again, description of Christ. He had a little book open in his hand. Now, the question of being, what little book is this? Is it the same book of chapter 5, verse 1, that now all the seals are open and you can read it? Or is it more like the allusion to Ezekiel 2, verse 8, through 3.14, about a little book that Ezekiel had to eat that was sweet to his mouth but bitter to his stomach? It was the judgment of God on the nation of Israel. Uh, I think that's the allusion he's pulling from in this little book. 
and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, a pretty tall angel. Matter of fact, the rabbis said that there was one angel uh, so tall that it was, it was taller than a 500 days journey over all the other angels. His name is Sandalphon. We got a big angel here. The clouds are around his head, I think, and his feet. Maybe to show the universality of the message, maybe the powerfulness uh, of the idea of the Word of God. I'm just not sure exactly why, but he puts one foot on land, one foot on sea. In a loud voice, he shouted like a roaring lion. Well, the word here really is the mooing of oxen, but it's used in a sense of a roaring of a lion, maybe a melodious voice here. And, of course, there are many aspects of the Old Testament talking about God is roaring as a lion. Uh, Jeremiah 25:30, Hosea 11:10, Amos 3:8, Joel 3:16 are just some of them. So this angel is, is uh, clothed not only in majesty but in the titles of God and Christ in other places. So it is a powerful, powerful angel. Now notice what it mentions here. And um, when he shouted, the seven thunders rumbled. Now are these seven thunders uh, somehow connected to the seven seals, seven trumpets. I think they really are. But when John hears them. Uh, he tries to write them down, and he's told not to, to seal them up. Now, it seems to me, if you take the rest of this, particularly the oath that the angel is going to say in verses 5 and 6 and 7, particularly 5 and 6, it's the idea that, that there's no more delay. God has worked with these uh, rebellious uh, uh, inhabitants of the earth. They have refused to repent, and now God's not going to give them another series of woes to try to bring them to himself. But final judgment is coming. And that's what I think the seven thunders were, were another series of woes, like the seals, like the trumpets, meant to bring man to repentance. But since there's been such hard-heartedness, God said, no, the end is now. And that's what I think we have here. Now, the idea about the, the seven thunders, some take this from Psalms 29, 3 and following, and it may be an allusion to that. Uh, they said, I was going to write it down, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal it up. Now, see it up, as it comes back to the book of Daniel, and much of the illusion drawn in these, these two chapters is from the book of Daniel. Daniel 8, 26, Daniel 12, verses 4 and 9. Some try to relate this to uh, Paul's vision of heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 through 4, but I think that's reading much too into it. Paul couldn't reveal it because it was so magnificent. It seems like that John can't reveal it because it's not going to happen. Now, notice in verse 5, this angel takes an oath, and he raises his right hand. This is a symbol of oath-taking throughout the Bible. It's found in numerous passages, Genesis 14, 22, Exodus 6, 8, Numbers 14, 30, Deuteronomy 32, 40, uh, Ezekiel 20, 15, and 28, and Daniel 12, 7, are some of the places this kind of allusion is made to, a, to an oath. He's, he's swearing to God. Notice what he calls God. Listen to the titles. The, uh, who lives forever and ever. That's the, cup, that's the meaning of the name Yahweh. Who created the heavens and the earth. So here is God as Redeemer, the covenant name for God, and God as a Creator, Redeemer and Creator. These same two titles go together. You might want to see the first one lives forever and ever in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, and God as Creator in chapter 4, verse 11. Here they are together again. Notice it mentions then uh, that there should be no more delay. Now, King James translates no more time, and the word here is chronos. But since time has something of a philosophical context, this seems to be not that time has ended and eternity has started, although I think that's true. I think it's more there'll be no more delays. There'll be no more uh, times for men to repent, and that's what I think the seven trumpets are all about. Now, uh, but in the days when the seventh angel speaks, when he is about to blow his trumpet, now notice the seventh trumpet has not blown. There's an interlude in chapters 10 and part of 11. Then God's mysterious message. Now, what is God's mysterious message? Well, I think it could be several things. I think Daniel is the primary background to which he's drawing. In Daniel chapter 2, 29 and 30, uh, the mystery of God's future acts in history are called the mystery. But I'm already pulled because I think this is the church and I think it's the gospel message. I'm pulled to Ephesians 2 and 3 where the mystery of God is the Jew and Gentile being included in one new unity in Christ. I, I, I can't be sure about the mystery. It's used several different ways. But I think the mystery of the gospel is that Jew and Gentiles have been made one in Jesus. Um, maybe it refers to both those things I just mentioned to you. And you might want to see Romans 16, 25, and 26 where both seem to be included together. God's future events and all men uh, have to come through Christ and are one new body. Now in verse 8. Then I heard a voice from heaven. Well, who is this? Well, in chapter 11, verse 1, this same voice is going to speak. And so um, I'm not 100%. Uh, is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it an angel? I, I'm not sure. 
And he said, uh, go and take the little book that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little book. Now, some commentators make a big deal about he asked the angel. The angel said, no, you've got to take it and use it as a symbol. We've got to take a hold of the gospel. I think we read so much in this book. Uh, we, make the, we push every detail in Revelation where we would never do that in a parable or poetry. And I think we're pushing too much. It's obvious there's the, the focus is a little book, not how he took it and where the little book is. And he said, take it and eat it. And it will make your stomach uh, bitter. But in your mouth, it'll taste as sweet as honey. And that's got to be an allusion back to Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, and, and you need to see that. Some say Jeremiah 15, 16, and 17, and that's possible too. It's the gospel message. It, it warms the heart, but there's an element of judgment to it. I think that's the idea here. Um, let's see. Some say as sweet as honey it goes back to Psalms 19, uh, 10, and 11, or Psalms 119. 103 and 104, it may be. John's drawing allusions from all over the Old Testament, but using them in different ways than their Old Testament setting. So I took the little book in the angel's hand, uh, and I ate it all. It's the idea that he internalized the message. That's the, the inference there. Look at verse 11, it says, And they said to me, Well, who is the they said to me? Why is the plural there? Is it several angels? Is it the Trinitarian God? I'm just not sure. You must prophesy again. Now, the must is dia, moral necessity. There's going to be more revelation. Well, well, who? About peoples and nations and language and kings. Now, this phrase with a slight variety is mentioned numerous times in the book of Revelation. 5, 9, 7, 9, 10, 11, 11, 9, 13, 7, 14, 6, 17, 15. God is working with all men. That's always been his thrust. The Antichrist is going to try to pull away all men from God. God wants all men to know him. And the Antichrist wants to pervert all men from knowing God. Now in chapter 11. Then a measuring wad like a staff was given me. Notice that John has become involved in these prophecies, not just watching angels do things. But look, now the rod is like a measuring reed. We learn from history that these, these stiff uh, river reeds, really marsh reeds, could be from 8 feet to 20 feet long. In the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 40, which I think much of the allusion is drawn from here about the new temple, uh, it's about 9 feet long that was given to Ezekiel. And I was told, arise and measure the temple. Now, what's, what's this idea about measure the temple? Well, I think it goes back to Ezekiel, chapter 40, verse 5, to Ezekiel 42, 20, where he describes this new temple, this eschatological temple. Now, there's some problems here because the end of the book of Revelation says there is no temple in heaven, and here's the idea of a temple. Well, I think it's the illusion of the book of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23 and following, about a heavenly tabernacle. And what John is doing is using Old Testament truths connected with the temple to describe New Testament truths about the uh, covenant in Jesus Christ. Here it's the idea of the temple. Now, there's been much discussion about what does the temple stand for. If you take it as being literal uh, Jerusalem, you'll see it one way. Uh, if you take it to being, um, let's see, the idea of the temple in heaven, you might take it another. Uh, some see it as uh, the idea of the temple in the millennium. I think there's different opinions here and we just can't be certain which it is. Some say it's the church. I'm tending that way. And uh, the temple of God and the altar, count those who worship there. Uh, that means those who are in the temple area worshiping. Uh, but leave off the outer court. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look at Herod's temple, it's, uh, the, t it's the court of the Gentiles. Now, that, that uh, place is used by Jesus in Luke 21, 24 to describe a period where Jerusalem is going to be trampled down by the Gentiles. Now, in my opinion, this uh, is a illusion that's used in several different ways. I think it is used for Titus in A.D. 70, destroying the temple. Uh, I think it, it's going to be used for other events that happen through the years, but it's going to be culminated in something uh, during the period of the Antichrist, like in Daniel chapter 7. I think we can see it, it already happened earlier in history, like back in Antiochus Epiphanes, which I think is described um, also in the book of Daniel. Now, let me continue then. Um, do not measure it because it has been given over to the heathen. There are several allusions in the Old Testament to this. Uh, Psalm 79, 1 through 7. Isaiah 63, 18. Uh, but particularly Daniel 8, 13. And also Zechariah 12, 3 in the Septuagint. Now Jesus uses that in Luke 21, 24. 
I really think Daniel uses it for Antiochus Epiphanes. I think Jesus uses it for the um, events under Titus in A.D. 70. But I think other parts of Daniel, and particularly his New Testament apocalyptics, use it for the end-time Antichrist. So here's the same metaphor going to be used several times, and we're going to find it throughout this. Prophecy is taking current events and, and throwing them into history where they cover events throughout history but will ultimately be fulfilled in the eschaton or these end days. Now, notice it says, And for 42 months they will trample the city. Look down at verse 3. Uh, for 1,260 days. Now, if you'll notice where this is used, I think it's going back to the book of Daniel. Times of times and a half times is used three times in Daniel, uh, 725, 12, 7, and 14. It seems to be uh, the ideal of a times equal a year, then it comes out 1,277 days, 30 days being to a lunar month. Now, it's used also in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 14, that little different number of days, Daniel 12, 11, with a little different number of days. Daniel 12, 12, with a little different number of days. And then in Revelation, here in chapter 12 and 13. It seems to me that as the outer court of the Gentile, outer, outer court was used as how the, the foreign powers are going to dominate the people of God through history, this 42 months is another very fluid symbol about times of persecution that affect the people of God. Let me say that again times of persecution that affect the people of God. I think when we try to find exactly a three and a half year period, or is it 1250 or 1290 or 1277 or whatever, we really get balled up. I think it's one of those fluid metaphors for a time of persecution, being exactly half the number of seven. Okay? Now, notice it says, um, and I will permit my two witnesses. Now, who are these? Well, they're going to be described down a little bit later in verse uh, C4, I believe as the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Now, the two olive trees are an obvious allusion to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, and then 11 through 14. Now, the two lampstands seem to be an allusion to Revelation 1.20 about the churches, maybe. Because in Zechariah 4, it's only one lampstand, but several bowls. There's two olive trees, but only one lampstand. So I think, again, he's taking and mixing these Old Testament metaphors. Some say, well, why are there two? Well, there are two olive trees in Zechariah. But the idea that of needing two witnesses to confirm a matter going back to the Old Testament, uh, particularly in things like Deuteronomy 17.6, Deuteronomy 19.15, Numbers 35.30, uh, may be an illusion here. Some say it goes back that Jesus set out the people two by two in Luke 10.1. Uh, I'm not real sure why there's two, but I think it's to confirm the message, to tell you the truth. All right? Now, notice that back up in verse 3, they're dressed in sackcloth. Um... Now, sackcloth seems to be an allusion to mourning, but it's also used quite often as the dress of the prophets. And you might want to see Genesis 37, 34, and uh, 2 Samuel 3, 31 for that, where it's the dress of the prophets. Maybe that's what it is here. That Zechariah passage says, not by power or by might, but by my spirit. Well, that's the idea here. Uh, the beast is not going to be able to overcome the church. Um, I think that's the allusion. Now, it says, anyone wants to injure them, fire comes out of their mouths. Now, is this an allusion to calling down fire from the Old Testament prophets? No, I think it's the power of their message. As the two-edged sword comes out of Christ's mouth, a symbol of the Word of God, so these prophets' message is the power that will slay anyone who stands before them. Uh, and if they try to be injured, there's going to be a protection on them until their uh, task is complete. But once their task is complete, uh, then they're going to die. Now, these two witnesses have been, because of the next few verses, 5 and 6, many through history have said it sounds like Elijah and Moses. And I think that's probably true. The Mount of Transfiguration, they were there, representing the Law and the Prophets. The fact they stopped up heaven, they turned waters to blood, that sounds like the activities of Moses and Elijah. Now, as others, going back particularly in history, like to uh, Tertullian and Hippolytus, uh, they, they thought the allusion was to First Enoch 90, Verse 31, where Elijah and Enoch were the only two Old Testament people that didn't die but were translated to heaven. Now, I hear what they're saying, but I don't think that's it. Others try to see in here uh, the church, and I think really the allusion is to the church using these two Old Testament prophetic types. And it's to the whole church, not to just some, uh, but primarily to the martyrs that are going to be killed by these forces of an anti-God world system. Now, 
Um, notice in verse 7, Then when they had finished testifying, the wild beast, this is the first time we've mentioned him, uh, we see him first as a little horn back in Daniel 7. I think that's where the idea of the beast comes from, is the illusions from Daniel. He's going to be picked up on in Revelation 13, 1 and following, and Revelation 17, 8 and following, and he is going to be the personification of evil at the end time. He's going to be the incarnation of Satan. Uh, he is the one, I think, who's called the, the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He is the one that I think Jesus was discussing in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Uh, I think that there has in every age been uh, an incarnation of evil in the sense of uh, someone ready to take over when God finally puts these last time events into play. And I think that will happen at the end time. Uh, whether that's real close and if we can identify what racial group this person is from, I think is very dubious. Now, notice where it mentions that he's going to kill these two men who I think represent the church. Notice he comes out of the abyss. Remember, chapter 9, verse 1, the place where the demons are held, the place where Satan is held. The Antichrist will come out of that in chapter 13. Now, and he'll make war on them. Now, them implies more than just the two. Daniel 7, 21. Maybe the idea of the people of God here. And conquer them and kill him. There's two kind of tribulations. There's a tribulation where the unbelievers persecute the church of the believers. And there is a tribulation where God persecutes the unbelievers. Now, both of those are happening in the book of Revelation. It's sometimes hard to tell which is which. Here, it's obviously that the unbelievers are going to persecute the believers. Now, their lifeless body, it's just one body here, which shows identifying the two as one. They do everything together. So it's just a, it's seen the two as, as one group here. Uh, let them stay there three and a half days in the street of that great city. Now, if you tend to take this uh, very Jewishly and literally, you've got to be the city of Jerusalem because it says the city where the Lord was crucified. But if you see this more as the overall struggle between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our God in Christ, then it's quite possible this great city could stand for any great city. In the book of the Revelation, this little, the great city is used over and over for the city of Rome. We see that in 1619, 1718, 1810, 16, 18, 19, and 21. It's Rome, but it's the very same phrase. Now, I really think it's this fight between uh, the, the forces of God and the forces of evil. I see that from the fact that, number one, that great city is used for Rome. Now, it says Jerusalem is called Sodom in a few passages in the Old Testament, but Jerusalem is never called Egypt. I think it's the allusion here for sin and bondage, but it's never called Egypt where the Lord was also crucified. That's the idea that the, the, the godless world system is the one that crucified the Lord, not just the Romans in Jerusalem. Then a little bit further it says down here, then all the peoples and tribes. There's a whole bunch of folks here from around the world. That doesn't sound like Jerusalem. That sounds like Rome. And then it says the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over this. The inhabitants of the earth is always used for unbelievers. And notice that the prophet's message was not directed just to Jews, but to these people of every tribe, because they're the ones uh, that uh, are glad he's dead. They rejoice for a period, then, then God's breath comes on them. Sounds like Ezekiel 37 to me. Uh, Tragedy is going to strike that city. Then it says the rest were stricken with awe. Were they truly repentant? Well, I think not. I think it's the idea like Nebuchadnezzar. They're struck with, they see what God's doing and say, wow. And they give praise to him in, in verbal, but they don't really convert to him. And so I think it's a, a false conversion here, but, but I can't be certain. Then the seventh trumpet blows. And from this point on, uh, we, we're coming back now. Uh, to the idea of the end time. I really want to cover this 15 through 19 uh, in my next lesson with a little more detail because I think it introduces to chapter 12. So I want to go back for a minute and, and, and just summarize, if I could, uh, what are the d general points here? Uh, really, the more you, you study Revelation, the more you see that your presuppositions determine what you do with the text. The text itself is so fluid that you can, in one figure, you can make it mean Christ, or it can mean Satan, and many commentators take them that far apart. Well, you can see if the, if the metaphors can be interpreted that radically by godly men, it is obvious these metaphors uh, we can't be dogmatic about, these illusions. But it seems to me that there is a consistent pattern and a consistent usage. Although we're drawing on the Old Testament, it's not meant to say this is the Old Testament people of God, Israel. For this reason, John is changing the metaphors. He's changing their meaning from their Old Testament context to his purposes, which have to do with the people of God and the gospel. 
Uh, he is, he is uh, bringing things that people who read the Old Testament would recognize, but he's really changing them to applying them, I believe, uh, to this tension between, uh, that I think we see in Daniel, the kingdom of this world are becoming progressively anti-God. There's going to become an ultimate kingdom that's going to be typified by Babylon, typified by Rome, typified by any civilization that uh, turns away from God. And in this end time setting, there's going to be a confrontation between this ultimate kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God in Christ. That's, what, that's the beautiful passage of 1415 that says the end has come. The kings of this world have become the king of God. Uh, Jesus' prayer about may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6.10, has come true. 1115 is the eschaton. It's the end. We, the cycle that ended in the sixth seal with the apocalyptic vision of Joel 2 now ends in the proclamation of all heavenly creatures uh, that time is over, that the kings of this world, the kings of our Christ. Now, I don't think it bothers me so much to have a, though I think it's an eternal kingdom, and I'll show you that next week. I don't mind having an earthly kingdom here. I think that maybe God wants to symbolize his prophecies in history. But I want to tell you there's a pattern to be followed, and I don't think it's a Jewish pattern. I think it's a uniquely Christian pattern. So be careful of your presuppositions. Watch out for dogmatism. We're in a pretty wild literary genre. And try to see if you can get the overall picture before you nitpick on the little bitty symbols. I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.